Thank you very much. So I have uh, some uh, conflicts of uh, interest to, to disclose. And if we go back to the oxygen cascade and uh, if we go back to our patient, he's in uh, septic shock, complicating pneumonia in a reduced lung patient. The consequences of this uh, septic shock is uh, altered oxygen diffusion. That's a reason why the is low. There's also inadequate macrovascular oxygen transport. If we calculate oxygen content, it's uh, around 11. There's also inadequate microvascular oxygen transport and a low microvascular oxygen tension. And also, a new note that sepsis drives impaired oxygen extraction and low cellular oxygen tension. The result is a cellular hypoxia or fetopathic dysoxia. And one of the results is an increased lactate concentration. One of the other consequences is the production of reactive oxygen and reactive nitrogen species and unfortunately, multi-organ failure. So to cope with this situation, of course, we are going to provide organ support, for instance, uh, continuous renal replacement therapy. We're going to try to resuscitate the mitochondria, uh, for instance, with uh, antioxidants, but for now, there's no clinical evidence for efficacy. We could try to resuscitate the microcirculation, but the same. There's no for now clinical evidence of efficacy. Eric has shown us that uh, microvascular resuscitation is the standard of care, and it may increase and improve the clinical situation. So the question arises as could we increase FiO2? So, what are the facts? Most critical care physicians prefer early initiation of oxygen, even without documented hypoxia. We are aiming for wider safety margin. And we do it very often because side effects of hypoxemia may be directed of the other So the question arises, what is normoxemia? If you take values from healthy volunteers, you will find PaO2 between 70 and 110 and ASAO2 between 93 and 98%. So the definition of hyperoxemia is very variable in the literature. It goes from 100 to nearly 500 millimeters of mercury. May hyperoxemia be dangerous? Yes, the answer is yes. We know that hyperoxia may have and may provide vasoconstriction, systemic inflammation, proliferative retinopathy, and the production of large amounts of reactive oxygen species. But hyperoxemia may also be potentially useless. These are the results of tissular PO2 in different patient populations, from healthy volunteers to cardiogenic shock, localized infection, and resuscitated sepsis. And you know and you see that in this last class of patients, there's an increase in tissue oxygen availability. One of the reasons for this is dysfunctional mitochondria. We know for some years that 
there is an inhibition of complex four and a nitrosylation of complex one from the mitochondrial electronic transport chain. And these may reduce oxygen consumption by the cells. So we may go for liberal oxygen administration. And this is a postdoc analysis of the hyper 2S study focusing on patients with septic shock according to sepsis free definition. The first bunch of patients had a lactate concentration above 2 millimoles per litre. And you see two experimental conditions. Some patients were exposed to a hyperoxia with a FiO2 of 100%, and the normoxia group had FiO2 tailored to a 88 to 95% SpO2. And you see that in this population, there was a trend for increased mortality in hyperoxemic patients. At the same time, patients with lactate inferior to 2 millimole per litre had no difference between the hyperoxemic and the normoxemic approach. So the question arises whether oxygen therapy and hyperoxemia may be deleterious in patients suffering sepsis. There are some similarities between hibernation or torpor and critical illness. These are situations where the body is um, aggressed uh, by different stimuli, infection for sepsis, but it may also be food scarcity for torpor. And in this situation, one of the response from the hibernating mammals is a decrease in metabolic rate. And this is also something we see in septic patients. So giving additional and non-necessary high FiO2 may be equal to arousing the bear. And this can be very dangerous. So at the other way around, we would like to be conservative and give our septic patients the least amount of oxygen that they actually need. And this was tested in the low code 2 study. And you see that oxygen levels were very different between the two experimental conditions. The study was terminated early on because of an increase, non-significant, but a clinically relevant increase in mortality and serious adverse events in the conservative strategy. So maybe we should wait and um, have a more balanced approach. And this was done in one of the large ICU rocks study, in which you see that the two population of patients have very um, close oxygen concentration and FiO2. And in this study, there was no difference in uh, 28 days or 90 days ICU mortality. And so maybe the answer lies in the middle. One of the reasons could be that increased FiO2 and increased PaO2 in septic patients could increase reactive oxygen species. You see that this is a quantification of reactive oxygen species in septic in a range and non-septic in green patients. And you see that septic patients have a large amount and very high concentrations of um, reactive oxygen species and their carbonates proteins, for instance. And in the RAC study, in, uh, in which the uh, PaO2 were very close between the two groups, there was no increase in reactive oxygen species 
in the liberal that is conservative strategy and one of the reasons why could be that the difference in PiO2 was very low. So let's sum it up. If we accept that normoxemia is between 70 and 110, there have been different strategies in different studies. In the ICU rack study, septic patient, no difference. In the oxygen ICU study by Girardis, um, which included 21% of sepsis, sepsis patients, restrictive strategy was beneficial. In the LOCO2 study, including mainly ARDS patient, restrictive strategy was harmful. And the HYPER2S study, which included septic patients with latex above 2 at D1, liberal strategy was clearly harmful. So I think that we should aim for a individualized strategy and with a more balanced and maybe stick to recommendations and aim for oxygen saturation between 93 to 96%. Because, as said Paracelsus, all things are poisons. It is simply the dose that distinguishes between a poison and a remedy. So maybe the answer lies in the middle and in medio stat virtus. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Julien, and, and congrats for, for this talk. Uh, any question, any reaction? Do you think that oxygen is really a, a drug, a, a poison, or not? Uh, Mervyn, Eric, what, what is your feeling? We have two minutes. Yeah, um, basically, um, com again, completely agree with Julien. Um, you know, we weren't designed uh, to be co um, confronted with hyperoxia. Um, so therefore, it, 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 you know, and there's a lot of experimental and human data, as Julian showed, to show toxicity. So why give uh, something in excess when it's not going to benefit the patient? Eric? Uh, I, I agree completely. I, however, I think that compared to what we're doing with uh, oxygen delivery and what's happening, we, we lack the tools for now to to assess when oxygen is becoming harmful. And which is probably one of the reasons we're still navigating in, in this topic. We, we, we don't know when that you know hyperoxia is actually uh, involved in the in in the uh, aggression with the ROS and 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 and, and such. So until we can explore that, it's going to be hard to uh, to phenotype patients and say, watch out, this is a patient where I really do not want to, to deliver, to give, administer too much uh, oxygen. So again, uh, we, that has to be, we, we have to find a way to assess that. And that's probably one of the explanations that all these studies are not giving uh, uh, co consistent results. You think that that's because perhaps that's just the underlying disease. We we, we try to show that uh, oxygen was was uh, poisoned in in uh, chest trauma at the early phase, and we 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 obtained the the just uh, the opposite, <laughs> the patient with with uh, with uh, more oxygen were those uh, surviving. Uh, that's just observational, but but. Do you think that should be really personalized or depend on on the on, on the injury? If the, if the injury is in the lung, for example, that can be different or timing. Perhaps at the beginning we we we, we should bring oxygen, and after we we should be very leg free. That we should be very uh, prudent uh, on day two, for example. Or do you think we we, we should really be uh, be uh, control the, the, the rate of uh, oxygen and, and, and decrease it as much as possible, uh, as soon as uh, possible. 
Yes, I, I agree with you, Mark, because uh, if a patient is uh, naive and the, um, the physician is naive to um, concerning the patient, and the patient comes in your ICU in deep shock and is very hypoxic, and uh, you have no uh, blood gas analysis, you have no monitoring, he's just coming from the, the street, and I think you are in the situation that you would like to give, um, let's say, um, a good amount of fluid, a good amount of oxygen, and, and maybe some vasopressors to, to restore uh, circulation, to restore oxygenation, but it should not take long. It may take one, two or three hours, uh, during which the patient will be exposed, maybe will be exposed to a hyperoxemia. And when you have stabilized the situation, you are under control. You can set the cruise control, and at that time, you, you control the situation. You, you may aim at reducing FiO2. You may aim at uh, giving less fluids and having a, a restrictive uh, administration of either fluids, oxygen, inotropes, because it will take longer. The patient will stay under the treatment. And at that time, you are in a situation where less could be more. Okay. Marvin, do you want? I just, if I may have the temerity to slightly disagree with Julien, my, my worry is that, again, it's mainly from animal models, but in the sort of resuscitation phase with ischemia, in other words, the reperfusion phase, you know, there's quite a few animal models showing excess harm if there's hyperoxia. So my, my slight worry is, yes, I completely agree, give them oxygen. The question is how much? And, you know, so, uh, you know, I, I'm slightly more cautious. Okay. Julian, do you have a take-home message? Yes, it will be done uh, a capella because uh, I have no slide to, uh, to sum it up. Yes, but uh, um, unfortunately, it would be um, something very very close to what uh, Eric just told us before. You, you may aim at individualize uh, oxygen therapy as long as you have uh, monitoring of what you do. So, yes. Okay, and you aim. drive is a word. <laughs> yeah. And you drive is a key word for all the presenters? Yes. I think it's, it's important. Original. <laughs>